Hi, this is Henry Sanders from Master 365 for another episode of Real Talk. And we have another school board candidate here. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Ali Maldro. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am running for school board seat four. So you have a lot of, I, one, you're a Pergolder. So you went to East. So best high school in the city, I have to say. Go Pergolders. Um, two, why run for the school board with all these issues, some of the highest disparities in the country? You know, we have a lot of different issues. You can never make parents happy when you're on the school board. You just never, there's not, you can never do enough. Why the school board? Well, I'm not intimidated by the opportunity to constantly strive to be better, right? That is something that I find deeply inspiring. The idea that there is more to do, that you can constantly get better, that there's more to learn, that there's more to think about. I think that is one of the more thrilling things one of the more thrilling opportunities you can have in being alive. I also think that people often talk about the school board as something that's really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the hard part of living in, unjust, in an unjust society is doing nothing about it. I think the, the vibrant, exciting part of living in an unjust society is changing it. I also don't take for granted all of the black women throughout history who haven't been able to see their names on a ballot, who haven't been able to cast their ballot. And so I feel that uh, there are so many people who worked and, you know, and gave and did so that I could arrive at this moment, and I, I want to rise to the occasion. Oh, that's a powerful answer. So talk about the historical perspective of Madison. I think people think now that all this data has just happened. This has happened for Madison for a long, long time, about achievement gaps. I mean, even back in the 90s, people were talking about this stuff. How do we, and how does your school board member in the community, actually start to address some of these historical issues the school district has had when it comes to achievement gaps? Absolutely. So I think that's one of the things that makes me uniquely qualified, because I've worked in education for 12 years in Madison and across the state of Wisconsin. And before that, the 12 years before those 12 years, I went to school here, right? So I've either been going to school here and experiencing the achievement gap as a young black person in Madison, or addressing the achievement gap. And that is, you know, how I have spent my time is working in diversity and inclusion. And so, you know, bringing that skill set of reconciling, you know, long lasting issues of, of race and gender and sexuality, uh, of, of, you know, preferencing certain young people and, and denying other young people opportunity uh, of bridging those gaps uh, is how I have spent my career. I have invested in the leadership of this community and our young people for the last 12 years, and I am asking our community uh, to value those skills and to uplift my leadership, to you know, promote, promote what I bring to the table. So you think, you think there is a chance that we can change some of the disparities in the schools? If, I mean, it, it seems like it will be a generational change. So for those who are skeptical, like, you know, you're never going to change what's going on in the schools, and those who are extremely optimistic, saying, hey, we can change this in the next two years, wh yeah. where, where, do you, where do you fit on that scale? Like, where we can make these changes? You know, I think that's part of the reason I promote arts every day is because I think what we need is an orientation of our imaginations. So when I ask my students, how will your cell phone be different 10 years from now? Uh, they, the possibilities are limitless. They're like, it's going to be a jetpack. It's going to be, uh, 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 it's going to fold into a home. It's going to be a bubble that, that allows you to move from one continent to the other, right? Because they're used to seeing their cell phone change. Their cell phone has changed over and over and over again throughout mm -hmm. their lives. When I ask my students, how's your school going to be different? in 10 years? It's a much more challenging question because they have gone to school at that point for about 10 years and they haven't seen the kind of large scale change that they have seen uh, in, in other areas of technology or society. I think that the achievement gap is a problem we create. It's not, uh, it doesn't just grow out of nowhere. We, we create the achievement gap. We make it happen. We create the wage gap, right? Somebody makes the decision to pay a woman less than a man for the same job over and over and over again. We have to start making different decisions. And in order to make different decisions, you need different decision makers. But I think 
ultimately having a, a person like myself, having a person like Ananda Morelli on the school board allows for us to shift our priorities, right? And so in prioritizing arts every day, we prioritize young people's creative thinking. We prioritize young people's originality. We prioritize young people's right to be different and expressive and vibrant. We promote you know, schools in which kids are dancing and using their bodies to learn. And folks have asked me about arts every day. You know, Does that mean kids are going to read less and do less math? Math. I said, no, only if you think of those things as mutually exclusive. But a good friend of mine, when I was you know, studying in undergrad, asked, told me, she said, Ali, I would have understood chemistry if somebody had just said it's cooking. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So for the kid who's going to access mathematics best by learning to read music, I want that opportunity available to that student. For the student who is going to learn to read because reading is about having an opportunity to get on stage and try on a different costume and become somebody completely different from a totally different time period. I want that kid to have that opportunity to engage in reading in that way. How would, for, how would you say the arts help with kids with the achievement gap? How are they, where's the connection to you? Right, so there is a gap in terms of who gets to go to private piano lessons. There's a gap in terms of who gets to take ballet. There's a gap in terms of who gets to do a fun culinary arts program over the summer. The, the difference between an affluent child and a child living in poverty isn't the classroom they're in. They can be in the exact same classroom. It is the, the opportunities that they're allowed to experience outside side of the classroom and I think one of the great equalizers of our society is education. But you have to bring those opportunities to the school. You have to bring that opportunity to dance. And I think a lot of times we we become fixated on behavior when we talk about students of color. And I think one of the things we know or studies have shown is that when students have robust opportunities within the arts, they are more engaged. It's easier for them to focus. They have outlets for you know what they're going through emotionally. They have spaces to move around. And all of that improves the quality of education, not just for students of color, but for all students. You mentioned Ananda. How did you, you guys like a very unique campaign, right? You announced together. Like, look at the smile on his face when I said her name. Like, so tell me about how did that happen? Why did you guys decide to announce it together? Was it symbolic? Like, what did that mean to you? Why did you two decide to do it that way? Yeah, so I think if you want to get like kind of the briefest answer is that we knew that we wanted to to be on the school board and to change education. We wanted to do things differently. And so we thought a way to, to signal that to our community was to say, not only will we be different on the school board, we're going to run a very different campaign. We're going to run a campaign that's based in, in unity. We're going to run a campaign that is about two women of color promoting one another. We're going to run a campaign that allows for us to talk about the benefits of having two people who have very different backgrounds working together. Right? So people were proud to work together. I think it's our duty to work well together in the interests of our children. And right now we have a school board that acts as though making other people look bad makes them look good. Um, and, and I think we, we wanted to, to distinguish ourselves as people who do not subscribe to that. It's people who are very invested in working collaboratively. I mean, I think when you get into the kind of beginning of that, you know, I would have never ran the first time if it wasn't for Ananda and Nichelle. I really look to those two women as how did they change the conversation and how did they, um, you know, run campaigns with the odds stacked against them. And show them that goes for everyone. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so those, those two women um, were huge influences uh, on my original, on my first campaign. And, um, you know, after I ran, I, I told Ananda, you know, I think part of what was really hard about running is sometimes it wasn't just that I was the only candidate of color. It was I was the only person of color in the room. I was the only person of color at the forum. And that allowed for the conversation um, to be dominated by, by the lens of, 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 pe- of the majority of people there. Right? So there wasn't a lot of people who could, had, who could speak to having shared experiences, who could speak to what it was like to struggle in school, who could speak to what it was like to be racially discriminated against um, throughout their lives. Um, and I thought that, that there was something so isolating about that. And, and we shared those experiences. And, and I thought, you know, it would be really beneficial for, for people of color to, to confront uh, those dynamics in solidarity with one another. Well, that's, that's great. So tell me about um, you and your opponent, 
uh, you are like the total opposite. Like even just the visual are totally opposite. Uh, and just listen to some of his stance versus some of your stances. You know, I, what I read his stuff is he said that we, we, we need more discipline in the schools. Uh, we need basically more structure for our kids. Kids should not uh, have the right to talk back to teachers, basically. Uh, he's for police in schools. You are like almost the total opposite. Like, so explain to me the biggest differences you think between you and your opponent on some of the issues? Yeah, so I think the biggest difference between me and my opponent is that I work in education and I've worked in education for the last 12 years. And the first job that he wants to have in education is running education. And I think that that says something about, uh, you know, what he thinks makes him qualified. You know, he has kind of an utter lack of experience in working with our schools um, and still feels entitled to be in charge of our schools. I think, you know, my opponent w really speaks to things that are indicative of the achievement gap. So he, he wants to punish black children. He wants to humiliate and hurt black children. He wants to promote teachers who humiliate and hurt black children. He wants to suspend and expel and exclude black children. He wants to do pretty much everything but teach children of color. He has no idea how to engage students of color, how to encourage students of color, how to make students of color feel welcomed in the class. He has no interest in that. Um, and, and I think that that is something that, that makes us miles and miles apart from one another. You know, um, He really emphasizes kind of a single set of issues. And I have a pretty expansive relationship with learning and with the intellectual growth of young people and with interventions that are developmentally appropriate, right? And so it's not that I am against the police. I think arresting a child is developmentally an inappropriate thing to do. I think subjecting a child to incarceration is inappropriate. You know, and I, I worked with kids in the Dane County Juvenile Detention Center for 14 months, once a week. And I interviewed students at one point for a project called Captured, in which we were asking students about their experiences while they were incarcerated. Um, and I asked one student, you know, the first question was just, what is it like to be incarcerated? A student said, what does that mean? I'm like, if you don't know the word to describe what's happening to you, it shouldn't be happening to you, you know? Mm -hmm. These are children. And so I think that really having a, a appropriate responses to young people who are in places of stress, who are in, in places of hardship, um, is really important to me. I think school safety includes the safety of our children, right? It includes making sure that our, our children are cared for, are empowered within their education, can navigate resources to help them when they're in a bad situation. But couldn't you argue that having police in the school is helping keeping the kids safe? I guess that's what your opponent would say, is that having police officers in the schools helps keep all the children safe. And you're, you would say your answer to that it would be... So we arrested 114 children in 2016, 2017. 97 of those children were black. The number one reason that children get arrested at school mm -hmm. is disorderly conduct. The number two reason that children get arrested at school is resisting arrest. I didn't know that data. That's that's fascinating too. But again, if I'm speaking for your point, I guess he would say, well, because yeah, he's a fascinating guy to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess he would say, well, if these kids are they're not behaving well, they shouldn't be in the schools, right? They don't they don't know how to behave. Why why have them in the schools? And I give you a perfect example. You remember last year at La Follette, they had all these trouble with these these about 15 and 20 kids that they were saying were causing trouble. Everyone was trying to figure out what to do with these 15, 20 kids. They're like, they're trying to disrupt the school. They're trying to disrupt the school. And I got to get around some of these 15, 20 young, all men or young men. And they were, they were disruptive, uh, but they also had a lot of brokenness that they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. A lot of trauma, their own trauma. The question I have for you, and I would ask him, is the same thing. What do you do with these kids who do have legitimate trauma who come into your schools? have their own issues and it might be it might come out as some behavioral issue you might see it as behavioral issues but they might need be last enough for asking for help how do you how do you balance that of giving the kids the structure they need at the same time dealing with some of those issues right like it's, it's a it's a balancing act when I work with teachers the first thing I tell teachers to do is to love their students 
right? And, and my dad dropped out of school when he was in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. Nobody had to kick him out. He left. Um, and my dad's mother died when he was three years old. And he told me when I was a kid, he said, when I went to school, all I wanted was a mom. All I wanted was some, for somebody to care about me. And when I couldn't find that at school, I had no reason to be there. Right? So if you have a kid who's coming to, to your classroom and their, their basic needs aren't being met, they're exhausted, they're hungry, and they feel like nobody cares about them, that's your first job, is to make sure that every single student knows they got somebody on their side. Mm-hmm. Right? Not somebody who wants to correct them or punish them or humiliate them or whip them into shape, but somebody who can see what's great about them and help them find that for themselves and then help them to explore that to its fullest potential. I can see you, man, your tears in your eyes. I I can see this is passion for, this is real for you. Um, Okay, so if I'm a white parent Mm -hmm. and my kids are in a Madison School District and they're hearing about violence, shootings, kids misbehaving, and then people, someone like you say, we don't want police in the schools, we want to love the kids, and I'm a mom or a dad with my kids in the school. My kids are doing fine. My kids are thriving in the school. Mm-hmm. Your kids are making a bath for my kids. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get your kids together, I'm going to take my kids and move out somewhere else. Mm-hmm. What message do you, would you give to those parents who hear someone like you and think, you know, she doesn't, you don't get their struggle. You don't get what, what they're trying to accomplish. What, what would you want them to know about your stance on issues? So my stance on issues is to do things that benefit all students and educators and families. And so I understand parents are concerned about their kids. I I understand that parents are are outraged about things that are happening in our schools. And I think what that symbols to me is that we have the community on our side when it comes to doing what's right. We have a, a community of people who care about their children and want their children to be successful at school. And that is not a difference between me and any parent. I care about your kids and I want them to be successful at school and I want all kids to be successful at school. And I think that what we have to understand, right, is when somebody says, we got to suspend kids because they're, you know, they're distracting the other kids. There's absolutely no data to prove that, right? So when we look at a school and we go, this year we suspended way less kids, Right, And maybe some of the same behaviors occurred. Maybe there was a little more disruption in the classroom. Maybe things got loud or, or hard on certain days. But our, our response was not to suspend children. There's no drop in reading scores because of that. Right? It's not like the kids who are doing really well stop learning when the kids who are struggling are also allowed to learn. In fact, all kids do better when the environment is supportive of all kids. Because even kids who are successful at school, um, you know, struggle in school when they see their peers being discriminated against or when they see their peers being treated badly. We act as though a kid, you know, having a rough moment at school is really distracting to another kid. Kids are used to other kids, you know, having a, having, having a hard day. What's really distracting to a kid is when a teacher stops everything or school stops everything and and focuses on the negative behavior of a single student, right, versus the positive behavior of the other 23 students, right? So why is it a really big deal when this student has a hard time and not a big deal when this student is is working really hard, right? Why, where, where are we placing our attention? And where we place our attention, that's the narrative that grows, right? That's the conversation we have. So we don't get to have the conversation about the kids who are doing really well and the support that they've got that's allowing for them to do really well. Because all of our attention is on a kid who's having a rough day, who's having a, a, a rough moment, you know, who's acting like a kid, mm-hmm. a kid who's having a hard time. Kids do better when their peers are supported, when their peers are given the opportunity to be successful. All right. I want to change topics just a little bit. So, as you're well aware of all the racial incidents that have happened in the school district, maybe what past six months, maybe, uh, then a young lady, a young child, 11, 11 year old girl, a baby, got um, in an altercation. Mm-hmm. Uh, depends on who you believe, uh, and uh, you know you understand what the ish his his decision. Uh, what's your take on all the reasons all these racial incidents have happened? 
Um, and then I want to come back to this this 11 year old and this incident that happened with her um, and this this grown man who's teacher administrator and I want to get that perspective too because I think it's really important for people to hear all sides and even if you go look on our site right if you look on our <laughs> our Facebook page people are in support of this 11 year old child mm-hmm. if you go to other media outlets they are, are in support of this this grown man as administrator so there's a clearly a disconnect of the facts mm-hmm. of what happened so start with the incidents that have happened the racial incidents that have happened what do you think the cause is and how we deal with that let's come back to this this 11 year old baby and got in an altercation with this grown man yeah so I think that the the instances that have occurred in terms of teachers using racial slurs in terms of of, of young people feeling belittled or harassed by by adults within their schools are not new and they're on, honestly not unique to Madison, right? Like we see, you know, instances happening in surrounding schools. I think right now, um, as as a culture, you know, as a society, we're really grappling with our identity. Um, and I think that what we have on kind of our, our national platforms is is fueling this idea um, that that it's an appropriate thing to lump. Uh, an entire group of people into a singular narrative, right? So you have a a president who refers to an entire nationality of people as as predators or as criminals. Um, I think that fuels in people or normalizes that idea as something that can be declared um, as a fact and with with all of the the full authority of the presidency behind it. Um, and so I think right now what we're seeing is, is a community, uh, you know, in a, in a moment of, of severe conflict in terms of deciding who we are, you know, what we care about, what we're willing to confront. And I think that these these issues have been underlying for a long time. For a long time, we've been able to ignore uh, dynamics that that promote the achievement gap. Um, and, and right now they're happening in broad daylight in front of entire classes of children. And we're going to have to start to talk about, you know, how we respond proactively to, to situations that incite uh, discrimination, that incite bigotry, that incite prejudice. And so now let's transition to this, this incident would happen with this 11-year-old child and uh, this teacher. I can understand, just being in the schools, these teachers are under a lot of stress. There's no question about it. They're in a lot of emotional stress. I've seen teachers leave crying. I mean, like, they are dealing with stress because they're dealing with a lot of our societal issues that are coming to their schools, and they're dealing with a lot of things that a lot of teachers before never had to deal with, right? So one part of me says, okay, a teacher under stress snaps. Right. So what do we do to help those teachers and those incidents to not snap? What, do mm. we, what support do we give them to to be able to handle the distress that they're under? Mm. Right. The emotional, the emotional, the mental. I mean, just think about if you're a teacher and you have a heart. To, if you have a heart. I've been to working teach, with students for 12 years. Right, so not and, a hypothetical. Right. And you see that pain every day or you see the kids come and challenging you every day. At some point, it has to get to you. At some point, it has to impact you that you want to lash out at some point. So how do you help those teachers deal with that stress? Mm. Right? How do you help them deal with that? And then for the, for the student side, think about being an 11-year-old child in a school system that you get an altercation. Let's just put the 11-year-old baby on the side. Think about all the other black kids and brown kids who saw that happen. Mm-hmm. And now they don't feel safe. They now know that a teacher has a right to, they have, they have a right to put their hands on you, mm-hmm. right? Those are such big issues, and both sides can be true at the same time. Mm. So what do you do with the teachers who have the stress, and then how do you help these kids deal with these issues? Well, I think there's a problem in that narrative, right? Like, I got so stressed out that I did something racist. I think that there's there's a there's a disconnect there, right? Because what we're seeing is not just oh, teachers are randomly lashing out at all children, right? 
Mm-hmm. Teachers are randomly holding every single kid to impossible standards um, and, and perpetrating harm recklessly. You know, what we see is students of color, particularly black students, are being targeted uh, for, for violence and derogatory language. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is about something that, you know, is, is part of a larger problem. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I've worked with with students for 12 years. I've never had any desire in any context to put my hands on a student. I have never had any desire in any context to use a racial slur to describe one of my students. I have not had that inclination, right? right? Yeah. I have not thought that that would solve a problem. Um, and, and I've had stressful days and I've had hard days as a teacher, and I think most teachers do, and I think the vast majority of teachers do not uh, assault students. Um, and I don't think that teachers think that you're defending their profession by giving teachers who do assault students uh, I, you, I don't know, an like, excuse. Look, I, I don't know if that's true, actually. Just from a Master 365 perspective, when all these racial incidents happen and we kind of write the stories, we get email after email after email from teachers defending other teachers. So I, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think teachers... I can't say all the There's teachers. 4, There's 4,000. There's 4,000 people employed. I'm just saying that there are, there are a, a faction of teachers who do believe that there is some realm of justification for these things. Mm. I mean, I, we have email after email after email that, that backs that up. So that's why I'm asking for both sides of how the teachers. So, but I want to talk to the, the, the kid, right? I want to talk to the, because I think this is important for our little brown and black wonderful children who are wonderfully made in our schools who are worried about their safety. Absolutely. And worried about th- what power they have or don't have and what power the teachers have over them. And what do we tell them right now about... I think what we tell young, young girls, right? I think what we tell children in general, but I think what we tell young girls specifically, uh, young girls of color, is, is if you come forward and tell me that an adult man hurt you, I will believe you. I will believe you. Yeah. Yeah, this is why this this whole thing with this 11-year-old child, it's... Uh, it's, it's a very complicated it's, thing it's because complicated. I think about her being able to Google herself mm-hmm. or Google this situation years from now. Right. And... and, and having experienced that and have this... There's this entire narrative yeah. that is she deserved it. Yeah, even, even, even if you read the police report, uh, the administrator's comments, he said that the young lady hit him with such force. And you like if you read the report, you think this is a grown person who was just brutal. And, like, and uh, to me, what scares me about that is is one where you find an 11 year old child in these ways and it's public mm-hmm. right and this will be and something people know about her for the rest of her life and but it's also sending a tone to the rest of the kids in our school that if you come forward you come people forward, will be really excited to discredit you right. people will be really excited to discredit your yeah. family that if you need help we will call you a liar and I think that that is a really irresponsible thing I mean my opponent went as far as to compare this 11 year old girl to an adult man in an unrelated incident who has been accused of of falsifying a claim in order to insinuate that she's lying. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what people should understand is that this child didn't come forward. People witnessed what happened to her. She didn't say, I I want to pursue this. She has, she she has been, uh, she is being used now to have a political dialogue. Yeah, this saddens me. But this does lead to a question I've asked all the candidates. So all the stuff we've talked about, the highest disparities, the racial slurs, the sense of this 11-year-old baby, all these things go on in our school district. Sell me or sell a parent out there who has a, a child of color. Why send my child to Madison School District? I think that the reason I'm running for school board is as a person who went to the schools in Madison, as a person who was born and raised here, I know that Madison is a beautiful place to believe in change. 
I think that we have to be attached to transforming education, not so that we become a, a, a district with a lesser achievement gap. I think there's a lot of people who get excited about going from the worst to the second worst. I have no interest in that. We have to transform education, right? We have to uh, be at the forefront of inclusion. We have to uh, say that our children have the right to a public education that serves them and meets their needs, um, and that we can't we can't back away from that. This some that it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for every child's right to learn. It's worth addressing uh, phenomena that create racial disparities within education. It, it's worth working together as a community um, to to make our schools what they've never been before, mm -hmm. which is fair to all children. Well, um, I wish you luck. And yeah, it's a tough road, and but we need good people on the school board. We need people who care for kids and care for families. I'm biased towards you because you're a pergolder. Uh, but you know, that's that's my bias. <laughs> I admit I'm biased, a pergolder. Uh, but why don't you let people know about your candidacy and why they should vote for you? Yeah, so I'm asking you all to vote for me on April 2nd or early at your local library. I'm asking you to vote for schools that are safe, welcoming, and inclusive, for schools that unite us in the interests of our children, and for schools that prioritize and invest in arts every education every day. Help me make Madison a school district where our students are dancing and participating in theater and accessing their full creative potential at school. Thank you. I think that was wonderful. And thank you again for another episode of Real Talk. Thank, thank you so much for having me, y'all. Yeah, but keeping it real. You kept it real. I appreciate that. I try. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>